bow and ask God to speak to us through his word. Father, we've sung your praises and we've come to your table, given our gifts, and now we ask you to speak to us through your word. And we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, the living word. Amen. It's been five weeks since I've had the chance to preach to you. Uh, maybe you didn't notice. That's okay. Uh, how many of you were here last week and you uh, heard Pastor Julian Spencer bring the word? And what a great gift he was to us as a church family. He, pastors Main Baptist in Aurora, has become a, a good friend as well as a brother in Christ. And we, you know, a co-laborer for the kingdom. And I really appreciate him. Uh, one mistake I think I made was so many of you love that so much. And we're asking if we could come back. I thought maybe I should have put him after me, not before me when I come back. Uh, but I, again, if you haven't heard that sermon, get online. And you'll be encouraged by it as he talked about humility and grace. Um, it's part of the reason for five weeks off is, is to plan for the next year, take some time to pray and to focus and look forward to the planning of what we'll be preaching and studying and learning next year. But also, my wife and I, the last two weeks, or prior to last week, were in Africa. We're in Zambia, Zimbabwe, and Botswana. Uh, we were visiting a cure hospital that we support there and seeing the work of some of the missionaries that we're involved with. And it was really a great gift to us and felt God bless us through that trip. And I'm sure you'll be, in a year you'll probably be tired. Yes, we know you went to Africa, Pastor Jeff. Stop with the stories. But for now, there's lots to tell, and, I'll, and I'm excited to share them with you. Um, we're in la two weeks left in our series called Uncomfortable Grace. It's been like a theological and practical study of the thing which we barely understand but do desperately need, the grace of God in our lives. And you might remember way back at the beginning of this series, I shared with you a quote by uh, author and theologian Paul David Tripp, who said, Uncomfortable Grace means God wants to take you where you don't want to go to produce in you something you, you could get no other way. I love that. God wants to take you somewhere you would not choose to go. Why? To do something in you you can't get any other way. To change you. And that's a perfectly appropriate statement for our series and very appropriate for our topic this morning. Money. Generosity. Giving. I, I want to take you where you probably don't want to go in this sermon. Because I believe God wants to do, say something to us. Now, um, I, I, my, my great fear is that many of you looking at your bulletin and hearing me say this are already t turned, tuned out. Uh, and I, in fact, I once talked to, talk to a guy who said, listen, I don't go to church because I don't want to feel guilty. I don't want the pastor's hand in my pocket. We've already taken the offering. There's no bait and switch here. I'm not trying to make you do anything. But I want to talk to you about something that I think is really important if we're going to understand God's grace. In fact, it would be obvious by its absence. It would be artificial for us to avoid this. Number one, because as a pastor, I talk to many of you about your issues, and a lot of them have to do with money. And number two, because... Even though we don't want to talk about it, Jesus wasn't shy about it. He talked about it more than he talked about heaven, or hell for that matter. It's all over the pages of Scripture. Timothy Keller in his book, Counterfeit God, says, There can be no genuine spiritual growth in your life unless you place your money and your attitude toward it in God's hands. You might not like that statement, but I believe it's true. You really aren't going to grow into the kind of man or woman God wants you to be unless you're willing to hand over your resources and your attitude toward them. You know, in the New Testament, there are three things that keep popping up over and over in the Gospels and in the Epistles and all over the New Testament that are sort of litmus tests for how you know that you understand the grace of God. You know what they are? Three things. The first is, your ability to forgive those who have wronged you. If you can't forgive, then you may not be in touch with the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ in your life. If you hold grudges, that's number one. Number two, your willingness to serve those who are different from you. If you won't give of your time and sacrifice your effort to serve somebody, then you don't understand the grace of Jesus, who's given everything to you. And number three, can you guess? Your wealth, your money. If your heart is shrinking into greed and selfishness and you're not generous, then you probably don't understand the grace of Jesus Christ. I think that's really true. Three things we should always keep in mind. Am I holding a grudge? Am I willing to serve? And am I increasingly generous? And if not, then I need to get back in touch with the grace, the uncomfortable grace. Let's talk about the third one, shall we? If you went to your doctor and you said, Doctor, I'm always tired all the time, and I keep getting colds and feeling sick, and I'm not sleeping well, and I just feel terrible, I need you to help me feel better. And your doctor said, ran the tests, the blood tests, the regular scans, and there's nothing medically that came back. Your doctor would probably ask you about your sleep habits, right? About the stresses in your life, about your diet, about your work, about your relationships. And what if you said, Whoa, whoa, doc, that's personal. Right? Just stick to the medical stuff. I don't want to talk about all my personal life. I just want you to help me feel better. 
Your doctor would say, rightfully so, listen, if you won't talk about this stuff, I can't help you feel better. Because it's, you're, you're a connected whole as a person. It's all connected. I think that's what God is saying to us when it comes to our wealth and money. Our culture would tell you different. It's off limits. I think he's saying, listen, you want to be close to me? You want to experience my grace? You want to grow in the kind of man or woman I want you to be? It's all got to be on the table. We have to talk about all of it. It might make you uncomfortable, but it's still his grace. You can't say, I want God in my life, but let's not talk about this. Now, there's lots of places we could go in the Bible to learn about how God wants us to view our resources, but the, the, the passage we're going to look at is the longest in the New Testament single text on generosity, and one of the most in-depth as well, one of the most involved. It comes to, from the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9. We're going to read just a section of each chapter because the, both chapters straight through are Paul writing to this Corinthian church talking about uh, generosity. We're just going to read two passages. Begin with me in 2 Corinthians 8 verses 1 through 10. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 1. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy, their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means, of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then by the will of God to us. Accordingly, we urge Titus that as he has started, he should also complete among you this act of grace. But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love is also genuine. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich." And in this matter I give my judgment. This benefits you who a year ago started not only to do this work, but also to desire to do it. Now skip to the way Paul finishes this discourse, uh, chapter 9, verses 6 through 15. Here's how he wraps up this whole teaching on generosity. The point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, he has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You'll be enriched in every way, to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. By their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others. While they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you, thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. This is an amazing passage, and I would encourage you, if you're not already in some Bible reading plan, you could do a lot worse than meditating on chapter 8 and 9 of 2 Corinthians this week. It's Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth. Corinth is in Greece. Many of you know that. It's down in the archipelago, the kind of in the, in the peninsula area, the coastal region of Greece. It was a very wealthy port city. Two things to know about Corinth, Corinth for our purpose and context in this sermon. Number one, they were uh, upper middle class to upper class, kind of like Geneva. They were, number two, they were pagan, they were Gentile Christians. So they weren't Jewish converts predominantly, they were pagan Gentiles who were converted to faith in Jesus Christ. Now Paul's writing to them, the whole discourse is because he's on a fundraising mission. Paul's trying to raise money to support famine relief for the people living in Judea and around Jerusalem. So get this, Paul is writing to rich Gentile Christians to get them to give money to support poor Jewish Christians. That's the reason. That's what he's after here. This brings us to the problem of generosity. The problem of generosity. When you read through these two chapters, if you do, one of the things that will stand out to you, as it jumped out to me, is that Paul, he urges, he pleads, he reasons, he never commands their generosity. He even says, I'm not commanding you. I'm not saying this as a, as a command. And later in chapter 9, he says, don't give out of compulsion because you, but because you want to. 
Isn't that curious to you? Do you think God wants you to be generous? <laughs> you're not saying yes, you're not listening, or you have real issues, right? <laughs> Do you think God wants you and me to be generous with our lives? Yes. Do you think he wants you to be greedy? No, right? right? Greed is the opposite of generosity. It's sinful. It's not God's will for you. Everywhere else Paul talks about sin, he says he commands you to stop, flee sexual temptation. Stop fornication. Don't stop stealing it. Right? Like he just, it's not like he doesn't suggest it. Can you imagine if Paul said this, what he says about greed, about, if he said about adultery? What if he said, listen, you husbands and wives, I only want you to be faithful to your spouse if you really want to be faithful to your spouse. I mean, I just want you to do it if, if, it, if you're joyful about it. Otherwise, don't worry about it. No, he would never say that, right? That's ridiculous. So why, when it comes to greed, does he say, I'm not commanding you. I'm not telling you have to. I want this to come from your heart. Why would he say it this way? Here's why. Because, to use the language of moral philosophy, when it comes to greed, there's no definite external behavioral referent. What does that mean? There's no number at which you know, if I give this much, I know I'm not greedy. Now I know. If you're committing adultery, my guess is you're not going, wait a minute, am I committing adultery? Oh, you know, right? You don't have to guess about it. You know there's a line you don't cross. But how do you know if you're greedy? How do you know if you're becoming selfish? How do you know? There's no definite line in the sand at which you say, this, at least I have to do this. Now some of you might be saying, well, wait a second. What about the tithe? What about tithing? Doesn't God command the tithing? How many of you have heard of the word tithe before? Right? Tithing mostly comes to us in the Old Testament, which is referenced in the New Testament. The Old Testament, 10% law of, basically, law of giving your first fruits, 10% of all your income to charity and ministry. By the way, studies show the average church attender in America gives less than 2%, so if it's a law, we're already breaking it. But if, if that's the line, even that line, is that a guaranteed safeguard against greed of our hearts? Actually, no, because it's very intriguing. In this whole passage, chapter 8 and 9, the whole long discourse on being generous to this, these people in need, Paul never once references the tithe. You'd think he would, wouldn't you, if it was a law? He doesn't reference it. And by the way, when Jesus references it in the New Testament, in chapter 11 of Luke, he does so in the context of rebuking those who think they're fine because they're tithing. He says to the Pharisees, the religious experts, you tithe not only on your money, but on a tenth of your dill, of your spices, right? But he rebukes them. Why? Because he says, you reject the justice and the love of God. Here's the point. To God, the issue of greed and generosity is entirely a matter of the heart. It's all a matter of your motivation. In God's eyes, greed and generosity are all about what's in your heart. So even if you give 10% or 15% or whatever the number is, there's no, unless our hearts are growing in joy and desire to be more generous, then we don't have generous hearts. This is the problem of generosity. The only way to be sure your heart isn't shrinking into greed and self-centeredness is to give and desire to give more. Now again, I, I worry that some of you are like, oh great, the money sermon, the pastor's gonna guilt us into giving. There's, no, there's nobody, there's no buckets when you leave, right? There's nobody's gonna make you do anything here. I wanna talk to you about your heart and my heart. This brings us to the lesson of generosity. If the problem is, how do you know, how do you safeguard against this? Paul gives a very interesting lesson, actually a case study in generosity. It's how he begins chapter eight. He talks to the Corinthian Christians about another group of churches in a region called Macedonia, also in Greece, but way up north in mainland Greece. Not wealthy at all, like the port city of Corinth, but up in the mainland and very poor by comparison. Uh, not destitute and starving, but they had very, very little by comparison. And Paul says, I want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God given among these churches. How do we know the grace of God? What's the grace of God? How do you see it, Paul? It's in their generosity. Let me tell you what they have done. He says they gave freely. They gave joyfully. They gave according to their means and beyond their means. And then he says they begged us for the privilege of giving. That's a curious line, isn't it? 
They were begging, which I'm, I'm, I'm projecting here, but it's quite possible that Paul is saying, we're not asking you for so much because you have your own challenges. And they're begging, no, no. We want to find how, how, how we can be part of this because God has done so much for us. I want you to know about the grace of God in them. Now, I don't think what this is saying is that they gave so much that now they're starving, we have to help them too. What he's saying is they didn't just give out of their surplus. They didn't just give grudgingly because I told them they had to or I begged them. They gave out of the love of God in their hearts, and they did more than we ever expected. They gave joyfully, freely, abundantly, beyond their means. Now let me take a lesson from the Apostle Paul, who said to the Corinthian church, let me tell you about the grace of God among the Macedonian churches. Let me tell you, Chapel Street Church, about the grace of God among a church called the Tubalenge Congregation in Zambia, Africa. You see an image here of my wife and I. Uh, Tubalenge is a Nyanjan word. It means show them, meaning show them by our love. I can speak Nyanja. Uh, I can say a couple of phrases. Men, repeat after me. Just men, ready? Nikukonda. Mikaziwanga. Nikukonda. Mikaziwanga. You just said, I love you, my wife, in Nyanja. Ladies, you can say, Naine Nikukanda Mamuni Wanga, which means I love you, my husband. I can also say, Nafa Anjala, which means I am hungry, and that's all I can say. <laughs> so, so I walked around saying, I love you, my wife, and I'm hungry all the time when we were in Zambia. Anyway, so we, th- we were at this congregation. The, the elders wear the, the red jackets, and we were there after the service and had a chance to worship with them. It's way out in the bush, this little cinder block church. Um, it was such a gift to be able to worship with them. We got there about 20 minutes late, and the service ran for about two and a half hours with the time that I was there, so it was close to a three-hour service. Not like us, right? 60 minutes, Pastor, I'm watching. We're out of here if you're not done on time, right? And one of the things that struck me, many things, just the singing and the joy and just the, 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 the pure love of the people, one of the things that overwhelmed me was about 30 minutes of their whole service was giving. They wheeled out this little cart. It like looked like a credenza desk. And it had like A, B, C, D, little, bo- little slots labeled. And each slot was a, a, for a, a giving destination. Widows and orphans, the children's wing they're building, and different things. And then they started singing. They'd been singing the whole time. A new, new song. And section by section, groups of people came dancing down the aisle, the middle aisle waving money over their heads, which I thought, what is going on here at first? Then I realized they're bringing their offerings, and they were dropping them in different slots. They would kneel down or uh, raise their hands to the cross and sing and then dance their way back to their seats, and the next section would do this. And this went on for a half an hour. About 10 minutes in, I was weeping, weeping. And at the end of it, they brought up their youth choir who gathered around all their gifts. Some people didn't have money. You know what they brought? They brought food. They brought big sacks of flour and, and stuff called enchima. It's like grits, except way worse. Um, <laughs> and it's like this little meal stuff they make. They make a little the patty of it, and they dip it in meat sauce. They use it, and they eat it. And some people brought big sacks of enchima meal and cooking oil to give because they didn't have cash to give to the widows and orphans. And then at the end, the youth choir got around their gifts and sang a song of asking God to multiply what they'd given, and they sang it in Nyanja. I want to share with you just a little bit of a clip from that last song around their gifts. You'll see here. It went on for like half an hour, so I had to stop it somewhere. I was just bawling. Why? None of it was showy, look at me, look what I have. But it was all praise. It was all praise. Now, Paul's saying to the Corinthian church, let me tell you about these churches by comparison to you who have so little. Let me tell you about the grace of God among them. Let me tell you, Chapel Street Church, about the Tubalenge congregation, who by comparison has nothing but the grace of God among them. Not to make you feel guilty, but to encourage you. You know, money, your money, our, my, our resources, it's like the last spiritual frontier in our lives in suburban America, right? I'll talk about almost anything else, but I don't want to talk about that. And the freedom I experienced there, just watching these people praise, who had so little, but yet another, you know, by another measurement had everything. 
Now, there's an interesting little phrase here um, that, that Paul uses in verses 13 and 15 of chapter 8. I didn't read this, but I'll read it for you now. It won't be on the screen, but you can follow in your Bible because he's, he's driving at the heart this lesson. So first he gives a lesson to the Macedonian Christians. Then he gives a different lesson. Listen to what he says in verse 13. For I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but that as a matter of fairness, your abundance at the present time should supply their need. So their abundance may supply your need. There should be fairness. As it's written, whoever gathered much had nothing left over. Whoever gathered little had no lack. Now, I never really paid attention to this. Paul's quoting Exodus chapter 16 there. The story of the Israelites when God gives them manna from heaven. Remember this story? Every morning they wake up and there's this weird cakes on the ground, that this bread from heaven that they can gather and eat. And those who have more strength and ability, they gather a lot, they have nothing left over because they share. Those who had very, could gather very little had no lack. That In other words, God provides for all of his people what they need. But do you remember what happens if you don't trust God's provision the next morning and you try to gather all of it and hoard it away? What happens to it? It rots. It stinks. Maggots grow instantly. In other words, you can't hoard it. You can gather it. It supplies your need. You can celebrate it, but you can't hoard it and base your security on it. Now, why would Paul go reference that story and compare our money to manna from heaven? I think for two reasons. Number one, I think he's saying that even though you work for what you have, it's still God's gift to you. The manna doesn't jump in the pot. You have to go gather it. But it's a gift. It is a gift from God. Paul's saying, until you come to see your money, your wealth, your resources as God's gift, not yours by right, but a gift, you'll never be generous. You'll never understand grace. You'll never be free. You might be thinking, well, wait a second. I mean, I realize, yeah, in, 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 in theory, right, God has been gracious to me, but I've worked hard for this. I've, I've struggled. I've worked for what I have. Okay, so you have. Fair enough. Did you choose to be born in the family you were born into with the educational opportunities you've had and, and the opportunities to grow in, in business that you've had? Did you decide to be born in this generation, in this country? Did you, did you before God knit you together in your mother's womb, did you say, you know what, I'd rather not be born in the 15th century in a rice paddy in China. I'd rather be born into an upper middle class in Geneva, Illinois. No, you didn't. That's a gift. Do you, do you know that you and I are in the richest one half of 1% in the world? You don't think you are because you're using the wrong measuring stick. But if you could divide the world's uh, 7 billion people roughly into thirds, do you know that tomorrow morning you could say this is true? Read Rick Center's book, Rich Christians in an Age of Hunger. It, a third of the world tomorrow morning will wake up and it is a statistical certainty they will not eat a meal tomorrow. It's guaranteed. They won't eat. Over three billion people. Do you know that another three and a half billion people will wake up tomorrow and it's a 50-50 proposition if they'll eat a meal or not? They might, they might not. The last third, don't even worry about whether or not they'll eat. Which group are you in? And of that group, we're in the smallest percentage in terms of what we have. Did you decide that or was that God's gift to you? Not to make you feel guilty, but to see all of your life is a gift of his grace. So Paul first wants us to see that it's a gift. Second, I think he's showing us that if you don't trust his grace and you try to build your security on, by hoarding it, it'll rot your soul. There's spiritual danger in it. It'll do damage to you. Pull out for a minute your little list. If you already have it out, great. Your little list of those things in your life that are gifts of God's grace. What's on your list? What's missing? What ought to be on that list? Everything. Everything. You'd need 10,000 volumes of paper to list all the gifts that God has given you and me. The truth is, we just don't have hearts like this. This is the last point, the heart of generosity. I think part of the reason I was weeping in Zambia was maybe I was jet lagging and overtired, but I think more it was because I was both encouraged and convicted at the same time. My heart was lifted because I saw the beauty of this worship service, and I also was convicted that my heart's not like that most of the time, but I want it to be. What do we do then? Paul gives us two things in chapter 9 
he implies two things that you can apply to your own heart to grow it in generosity. The first one in verse 6. He says, the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. The first thing is get a vision for the true harvest. Get a vision for the true harvest. Now some people have taken this verse, verse 6, and tried to make it into like a prosperity gospel, meaning, oh, if I sow generously, which means give a lot of my money, then God will uh, give back to me generously. I'll reap generously, meaning I'll get more money, as if it's some sort of heavenly divine investment strategy that's foolproof. If I give, God will give me more. Well, this, for one thing, it breaks the metaphor, doesn't it? The whole section here in the metaphor is about sowing and reaping, planting and harvesting. It's agricultural. You plant seed, but you don't reap more seed. What do you reap? Fruit, harvest. The point is you don't get back exactly what you put in. You are blessed, but not the same way. It's not a way for you to get richer, in other words. I have a good friend who uh, goes to our church, and I, I'll keep him anonymous, but he's remarkably generous, not just to us, but to many, many things. I've gotten to know him over the years. He humbles me by his generosity. He says, you know what I really want? I said, what? I'm thinking like financial integrity. What do you, <laughs> what do you want? He said, I want the stories. He said, what I, what I, when I give, because God's blessed me, what I give, what I really want is to hear stories of people's lives being changed. Notice what Paul says. He will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. What's that? Righteousness. It's a churchy word. I'm guessing you didn't use it this week in conversation. How many of you said, hey, Bill, how's your righteousness doing? You know, you don't, you don't talk that way, right? It simply means to be right with, right relationship with God and with other people. So what it's saying is when we give to the work of God in the local church and in the world, what we get in return is not more money in our 401k, but more people being put right with God, more families reconciled, more lives healed, more freedom from addiction, more people discovering the hope and joy and peace that is only found in Christ Jesus. That's what we're after. That's why he says, whoever sows generously will reap generously. Not more cash, but more people being made right. That's what we're after as a church. The second thing I think he gives us is in verse 15, the very last verse of this whole section on generosity, the Apostle Paul says, thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. That's how he finishes. What's the inexpressible gift of God? Ah, some of you whispered it. You can't get this one wrong. What's the inexpressible gift of God? Jesus. Come on, if I was Pastor Julie, I'd be telling you to shout it, right? Jesus. Jesus, Jesus Christ himself is the inexpressible gift of God. Romans 8.32 says, How can God, who did not spare his own son, but graciously gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him give us all things? How, the God who gave didn't hold back his son, but gave him to us. How will he, we can count on him to give us all things? In fact, he already has. Meaning if you are in Christ Jesus, if you know the grace that comes in knowing that he loves you, you have everything. You have everything. You're called his son or daughter. You're called beloved. You're called an, an heir of the king. You have the hope of heaven. Your past is redeemed. You don't have to feel shame about what happened in the past. Your present makes sense because he's with you. And your future's secure because you know who holds it. It's, you have everything you could ever ask for if you're in Christ. This is why Paul in chapter 8 verse 9 says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ who though he was rich, there's an understatement, for your sakes became poor, so that you through his poverty might be made rich. Not money. You might be made rich in him. Right with God, having your heart redeemed. I love how he finishes. For you know, for you know the grace of God. For you know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know? Do you know? Maybe you've just forgotten. I think part of going to Africa for me was a great reminder of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Who though he was rich for your sake became poor 
so that you, through his poverty, might be made rich. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are a generous God, far more generous to us than we deserve, having done more for us than we could ask or imagine. Forgive us for being so small-minded and small-hearted. Help us, by your Spirit, to get in touch with that uncomfortable and amazing grace. Help us to know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray in his name. Amen.